Okay, we are live. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, all right. So um, welcome to Facebook Live, and uh, it is February twenty first, two thousand and nineteen, and um, we are here at the Coccyx Pain Center or Tailbone Pain Center here uh, in the United States. Uh, I'm Dr. Patrick Foy, I'm an MD or medical doctor, and with me is Dr. Jason Woon, uh, who is a, a PhD, uh, who's in from uh, New Zealand, uh, and uh, Dr. Woon uh, gave a lecture uh, last night here at the uh, Tailbone Pain Center uh, on the topic of coccyx anatomy, which is uh, basically the area he uh, did his uh, PhD work in, uh, and coccyx uh, imaging studies, uh, again, uh, an area that he has uh, published on. Uh, so really the, uh, the idea for this Facebook Live session is just going to be kind of a uh, question and answer uh, from the uh, research and publications and things that Dr. Woon has done and from you know, perhaps uh, interlaced with uh, some things uh, from uh, what I've seen uh, clinically uh, here at the Tailbone Pain Center and um, basically looking to uh, answer whatever questions uh, people have. Uh, in general, for Facebook Live, um, a couple of quick uh, sort of disclaimers. Uh, this is not a substitute, uh, you know, Facebook is not a substitute for in-person uh, medical care. Uh, so this is not considered medical advice, but really uh, just an educational session. Uh, also, if you post questions here, uh, this, you know, the internet, of course, is a public place. So, uh, so use, your, use your own discretion. Uh, regarding uh, how much private uh, information you want to post here. Um, having said that, you know, ask questions and uh, rather than medical advice, what we'll do is take your questions and give you uh, our best answers as far as, uh, as, far as uh, topics that you'd like us to discuss, specifically uh, in, this, uh, in this particular session uh, on the topic of coccyx anatomy and also, uh, you know, coccyx imaging studies. Um, so, um, with that, I don't see any questions yet, but as you, uh, as you have them, post them down below and we will uh, we'll read them here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Woon, uh, both to the United States and also to this uh, Facebook Live uh, session. Yeah. Um, maybe for starters, why don't you tell us a, a little about yourself and uh, how you uh, started uh, becoming interested in the coccyx as an area for your research and publications. Sure. Um, Thanks for having me. Um, so I studied anatomy for, for four years and then afterwards um, met with a surgeon uh, who had an interest in coccyx uh, research and uh, he's saying there was a huge lack of it and um, together we discussed um, certain topics to study and I, uh, I studied it for three years and we did quite a bit of work in that time and then now I am in medical school and I've decided to take on that mantle again mm -hmm. and focus more on uh, imaging, coccyx imaging and anatomy. Excellent. Yeah. So um, certainly I would agree it's an area where there's a, a lack of, uh, a relative lack of physicians and researchers that are uh, looking at the tailbone, that are studying the tailbone and publishing on this area and treating yeah. patients with this. Yeah. Uh, so certainly it's an area that, um, you know, we need, you know, we need smart, young, energetic, you know, you know, uh, you know folks like yourself mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to basically, uh, you know, move, the, move things forward as far as the, uh, the research uh, in this area. Um, the screen here seems to have uh, gone out for a moment. Um, I'm not sure if people can still hear me or not, uh, but What's going on? let's see if that is the. I'm wondering. Oh, okay. okay <laughs> it, it, it looks like we're back. Um, so the uh, the Facebook. Okay. Gremlins, uh, the Facebook Gremlins went went uh, blank on us for a moment, um, but we're back. Uh, we're back in business here. Um, so, um, so basically, um, you know, certainly I can echo the things that you said in terms of uh, you know this is an area that uh, you know that needs people to uh, do research and uh, and publications, um, and uh, and really to you know help move things forward. 
Uh, the first time I met Dr. Woon uh, in person, but, you know, I've certainly uh, read his uh, publications for years now, um, but we met in person at the uh, International Coccyx Pain uh, Symposium uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands in June of 2019. Uh, someone's saying it's a little hurt, a little difficult, or 2018, yeah. sorry, thank you. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and that was a terrific opportunity for people from around the world to, uh, you know, to get together that have a, an interest uh, in this area. Uh, someone's commenting that it's a little hard to hear uh, Dr. Woon's voice, so um, I don't, we don't have a microphone, we're sort of just doing this uh, kind of on uh, last minute notice uh, on my iPhone, so um, what I'll, we can do is... I'll, I'll try and speak a bit louder. <laughs> Good. How, how's that? Can you hear me? If that's better, you know, uh, you, know you can give him a, uh, a thumbs up or a, uh, a comment there. Um, what was the, tell me a little about, um, you know, some of your publications, specifically, you know, the, 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 the gist of what you found. Uh, I know you've published about the, okay, I see a thumbs up, so thank you. Uh, you know, some of the things that you published on um, uh, CT scans and on uh, the anatomy and, and some of those things. So why don't we start that uh, with that? Right. <clears throat> so, um... Uh, so I looked first at normal scans. So scans, the coccyx, what does the coccyx look like in normal people? Uh, we know that um, coccyx pain is more common in women, about four times more. And so uh, we were looking for differences uh, in the anatomy of the coccyx between men and women. And um, what we found was um, that women had straighter coccyges and this makes sense because women's uh, sacrum uh, are wider and straighter and shorter. Yeah, so that's the sacrum. So if, uh, if you had, a, it's, and that's um, for the reasons of giving, uh, for childbirth. See, if, if, if the child were to go through the pelvic outlet, the coccyx forms the, the back part of the pelvic outlet. And so it makes sense for women to have straighter coccyges to give more space in the pelvic outlet for the baby to come out. And, and we found that women had more straight, uh, a more straight, straighter coccyx. Uh, and then the next part of our study, we looked at the anatomy of women with coccyx pain. Um, and, and we found that women with coccyx pain had um, a coccyx that was more curved forward. Um, one limitation to the study uh, is that um, we, we didn't have any information on the parity of the women, whether they have given birth before or how many or how many times. Mm -hmm. And so it would be interesting to see if um, uh, women who have given birth, who have a more curved coccyx, um, would uh, be predisposed to coccyx pain. So, yeah. Okay, neat. Um, one of the questions we have here is, uh, do we recommend imaging studies with coccyx pain uh, for uh, those who, uh, women who after uh, giving birth vagin vaginally, uh, that they have um, bruising or fracture or imaging? Um, certainly, uh, as Dr. Woon was referring to a moment ago, it is certainly an issue with, um, you know, with uh, vaginal delivery, you know, as he was pointing out that, you know, again, sort of if you look, you know, looking here through the, you know, through the birth canal, essentially, you know, as the uh, child's head and shoulders pass, pass through the birth canal, you know, you can see how the tailbone is, is sort of in the way there. Um, so there are certainly times where uh, in the labor and delivery room, the patient, their partner, the, um, the birth team, the doctor, nurses, midwife, whoever, may actually hear a cracking sound as the, as the tailbone is fractured uh, or, dis, or in some cases dislocated uh, during uh, you know, delivery, during childbirth. Um, so the question, back to the question, which is about imaging studies afterwards, 
Um, yes, if the if the tailbone pain is is um, persistent, which is the, certainly the majority of the folks you know who who I see are people where the pain has been going on for a long time. You know, it didn't just get better in a in a few weeks or a month or two. That it's really becoming a persistent uh, and and long term problem. Um, imaging, imaging studies are absolutely uh, crucial. Um, it's important that the imaging that they do the proper imaging studies. Uh, a lot of the uh, imaging studies that are done. Um, sort of the, the, the medical world is, is on default to think about low back pain up in the lumbar spine, you know, up, where the, uh, you know, up around the belt line, which is much more common, uh, whereas the tailbone you know, is all the way down here you know, at the, the lowest tip of the spine, just slightly above the anus. So a lot of times the wrong imaging studies are done. There's imaging of the lumbar spine that fails to include the coccyx, or the imaging is not done in a way that, that really shows uh, the tailbone adequately, either on X-ray or MRI or CT scan. Uh, so, um, so, so to answer the question, yes, imaging studies are important if the pain is uh, is continuing um, after labor and delivery or after any other uh, cause of tailbone pain. Um, but it's imp important that the test be done uh, properly. So, okay. Um, so we've got another question here. Can you explain idiopathic coccidinia? Um, I can give it a shot and then you can fill in the blanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Team effort, of <laughs> okay. course. Um, so idiopathic means uh, uh, the cause of the pain is, is not known. Uh, and that's, um, that comes about uh, through a process of elimination. So um, usually the patient can tell you if there was an, an event uh, that, that caused the pain. So maybe uh, some form of trauma through a fall or a, or a kick um, or a childbirth. Uh, and sometimes uh, there is no precipitating event, uh, in which case, um, through a series of investigations, you can cross out a few more things, uh, such as dynamic instability. Mm -hmm. uh, and failing that if, if that, if that doesn't give you an answer, then you can call it idiopathic. Mm -hmm. I would agree. So, um, and just to, to echo what Dr. Wu said, so idiopathic is really in, in medical jargon means that the uh, physician doesn't know why a given thing is happening, right? So, and you know, and for tailbone pain or coccidinia, it's just, boy, I'm not sure what's causing that. Um, the problem is that in, to some extent, it is a little bit of a, uh, a wastebasket term in the sense that, um, you know, coccidinia, although you know, many physicians will use it as a as a diagnosis. In reality, it's a symptom. Um, it would be like saying instead of coccyx pain, let's say if I was saying I have chest pain. No physician would feel that comfortable saying, "Oh, well, then the diagnosis is chest pain, and we don't have to look any further." Uh, but unfortunately, at the tailbone, that happens all the time, uh, where somebody comes in, they say they have tailbone pain, uh, if or they point to the tailbone as a source of their pain. And um, first of all, they may be, they may be um, mislabeled as having, uh, as having uh, pain that's in the lumbar spine or just general, quote unquote, low back pain, uh, when really this is, uh, this is um, lower than that. Um, and then basically the, um, uh, you know, the issue is that um, the proper, again, back to really, it's really back to the issues that, uh, you know, the issue that um, you know, uh, Dr. Woon is mentioning and has published on about imaging studies, and certainly the Dr. Main in uh, Paris, France, has published on uh, sitting uh, x-rays, is that um, the proper imaging studies need to be done uh, to make an accurate anatomical and radiologic diagnosis. Uh, and uh, I see, you know, I've seen a couple thousand patients with tailbone pain. People fly in from around the country and, and uh, internationally. Um, and a lot of times what has been labeled as idiopathic coccidinia, meaning we don't know what's causing this, uh, then, um, then basically it, gets, it, it changes to, oh, now we have a specific diagnosis where we may be able to identify you know, um, one specific joint that is abnormal, that's unstable, that when the person sits, if somebody goes to, if the, if somebody goes to sit down, uh, you look for there to be a certain amount of movement at the tailbone, um, but sometimes that movement can be, uh, you know, can be excessive. Uh, so really, then it's no longer idiopathic coccidinia; it's coccidinia caused by uh, a specific uh, unstable joint. 
Um, we had another, a few other comments on here. One was asking, can we come to Southern California? And given that, given that we've been having snow here in New Jersey, and about a week and a half ago, it was, you know, it was in the, uh, it was below zero uh, for a while there. Uh, you know, Southern California sounds, uh, sounds absolutely lovely. Uh, so, um, you know, I'll have to uh, talk to my wife about seeing if we can, uh, if I can, you know, travel to set up a, an outpatient clinic there uh, and, and uh, you know, where the weather is a little milder, uh, certainly in the winter. Um, and also I had, we had uh, greetings to, uh, to someone who I met uh, in the Netherlands. So awesome to see you uh, online here. Um, there was a question about, um, there's a couple that are scrolling by and um, I think uh, I just want to make sure yeah. we didn't miss some. One was about pudendal, yeah. pudendal nerve. Do you want yeah. to talk about that? Or? Okay, um, I, can, I can start. Great. So, um, so the pudendal nerve uh, is, is, a, is a nerve that, so it's not coccidinia, but it's, it's, it's often associated with coccidinia. Mm -hmm. the, the pain is different. The pain you feel from a pudendal neuralgia, uh, it's more in your perineum, so it's more on the front, as opposed to coccidinia, which is uh, ex it's a ta it's a focal pain on the bone, mm -hmm. uh, and the pudendal nerve, the roots come from higher up, uh, S three to five, and and it goes through um, uh, different anatomical structures, and sometimes it relates to the coccyx, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. So, um, so basically, um, yeah, as Dr. Wu mentioned, the um, the the uh, way to discern two. Well, there's two things. Number one, some people may be mislabeled as having one versus the other. Uh, you know, and you know, for physicians that do not treat a lot of pelvic pain syndromes, anything that's painful in the pelvis, they'll call it you know pudendal nerve pain. And and you know, medical term for nerve pain is neuralgia, so they'll call this a pudendal. Neuralgia. Pudendal is the name of the nerve, um, and uh, and as Dr. Moon mentioned, the pudendal nerve is made up of um, you know nerves that that leave uh, at the sacrum. So this the lumbar spine you know is up here. The belt line would be about here. This triangle shaped bone is the sacrum. Um, this side of the model shows some of the you know, some of the uh, exiting nerve roots, uh, and uh, there's a number of nerve roots that come together to form the pudendal nerve. Um, the uh, main things that are different about the pudendal nerve, as Dr. Woon mentioned, uh, that uh, compared to coccyx pain, the coccyx pain tends to be right here at the middle, uh, right at the right at the midline, uh, in at the back of the of the pelvis, uh, and relatively low down, below the sacrum and just above the anus. Uh, as opposed to the pudendal nerve, there's a right and a left pudendal nerve. Uh, so the pudendal nerve, you know, swings off to the side. It comes over to this, you know, little area you can maybe see on the bone here, which is the ischial spine, uh, and then it drapes around that and then swings down, uh, you know, towards the front. So basically it's swinging down towards the uh, area of the external genitalia. Uh, so if someone has pudendal nerve pain, uh, usually that pain is going to be more in the front rather than back at the tailbone, and it's going to be uh, rather than you know right at the midline, it's going to be you know either right or left uh, of midline. Uh, so you know at the front of the at the front of the pelvis, you know sort of in the area of the pubic bone and the external genitalia. Um, you know patients may report that their external genitalia area feels you know um, either it's numb or it's burning, tingling, pins and needles types of pain syndromes. Uh, it can certainly be very, uh, you know, concerning and, and disabling, uh, you know, when patients have problems in there. And um, there are uh, injections and surgery that can be done for, uh, for these conditions. Uh, usually you want to start with the simplest things first. Uh, and uh, the injection that's done for the pudendal nerve, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the spots is, as I pointed out, at the ischial spine uh, as opposed to at the coccyx. And um, one of the things that can be done is a, a diagnostic nerve block where we put a tiny amount of a concentrated local anesthetic there and see if that relieves the patient's symptoms. And that can help to tease out uh, you know, what nerves were involved in a given patient in, in, cases, in some cases where the clinical history and physical alone might not have been able to, uh, to answer that. Um, if you're interested more specifically on pudendal nerve, uh, on my website, which is uh, www.tailbonedoctor.com, forward slash blog, B-L-O-G, um, there's a little search box there, and if you put in pudendal, P-U-D-E-N-D-A-L, pudendal, 
uh, it will pull up uh, any uh, of the online articles that I've written on the pudendal nerve. All right, another question zipped by that I didn't see. So, um, I was talking about uh, the insurance policy surrounding steroid injections. Okay. Uh, patient had the steroid injection um, denied. Uh, what do you recommend? Okay, so um, so yeah, the um, so the insurance issues um, the insurance issues uh, sometimes can be um, challenging. Um, I can tell you, it has been many times. In fact, I was just on the phone today with a, a medical director for uh, an insurance company uh, in getting authorization for a patient of mine uh, for her uh, for her MRI uh, studies at the coccyx. Um, many times I've been on the phone with insurance adjusters, um, you know, nurse case managers. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times they've said something like, oh, well, this is, um, you know, this is not the spine, so it would go through a different criteria. They'll say because the tailbone is not part of the spine, to which I always, you know, raise my eyebrows and think, Really, you know, can you, you know, uh, do you have access to the internet or Google? Can you put in, a, you know, a Google search for human spine and pull up uh, an image search? And you'll see that, of course, you know, the, the coccyx is indeed, you know, part of the spine. Um, but really what they're saying is that in their protocols, tailbone pain happens so infrequently compared to pain and other problems with, you know, in other parts of the spine that they don't have it on the radar. They don't have a protocol for it. Um, so they have a criteria for, uh, you know, for MRI or injections at the cervical spine, which is the neck, the thoracic spine, which is the area that the ribs attach to, the lumbar spine uh, and sacral, so lumbosacral spine, which is kind of the, the small of your back. Um, but then, the, but then the criteria stop, and they're silent about the tailbone um, because, again, you know, it doesn't happen near as often. Um, so there's, you know, I, don't, I haven't looked at the statistics recently, but let's say that if it's, you know, 10 or 20,000 times more common that someone, that, you know, more likely for someone to have low back pain compared with tailbone pain, then the insurance companies don't have a protocol that they put in place for authorizing it, or they start applying the criteria that they would have for their lumbar spine to the tailbone. So, oh, you want an MRI? Well, is there numbness or weakness down in the leg? Well, that's a reasonable question if you're asking, if you're trying to get an MRI of the lumbar spine, mm -hmm. but it's a completely, you know, irrelevant uh, question uh, if you're trying to get an MRI of the coccyx because the nerves of the coccyx do not go down to the leg. Mm -hmm. All right, what other questions? Um, so before the... Uh, Lauren was asking about UC ulcerative colitis if it uh, if the colon adheres to the coccyx in uh, severe UC. So um, very interesting. So the um, I can't say that I've seen the colon uh, necessarily um, inflammation at the colon. Let's say from ulcerative colitis causing in, uh, inflammation of the coccyx, but certainly I, you know they are very very close anatomically. Uh, and Dr. Wooden and I have talked a lot about this over this uh, over this past week um, in terms of the uh, the anatomy in this area. Um, in fact, we've had you know long discussions about the the uh, the space in between the the rectum and the sacrum and coccyx and the and the anatomic structures that are there. Um, but there is a but there is there are some layers in between. We have, You've described as sort yeah. of a lasagna. Why don't you yeah. talk about that? Um, These are the things that we talk about when, they, when the video, when, when we're not on Facebook Live, you think, what are they talking about? Yeah. We're talking about sort of like the, uh, you know, the specifics of the anatomy of the sacrum and coccyx area. So um, just in front of the sacrum and coccyx is a potential space. Uh, it's called the presacral space. And, and that's the space lies between your colon or your rectum and your sacrum and your coccyx. This space um, can be seen on MRI, and um, one way to measure how thick the space is is by doing a barium enema and then doing um, an X-ray, and then you can measure the, the space of it, and you can see it on MRI. So um, I haven't seen patients with severe UC and with, and adhering to the coccyx, mm -hmm. but it makes sense if the colon mm -hmm. was severely inflamed mm -hmm. and that space got less and less, mm -hmm. then it would be almost touching the bone. Interesting. Yeah, and they are very close. And you see yeah. that you see the, how close they are 
uh, on MRI studies or even sometimes on x-ray and fluoroscopy, you can see this, um, you know, the normal air pattern of air that's within the rectum and feces within the rectum, um, you know, prior to having a bowel movement, uh, and you can see the coccyx immediately before that. Um, one other, um, jumping back for a moment to one of the questions here that was, the question that was about the, um, the corticosteroid injection, and uh, it looks like that was a question about uh, workers' compensation. Um, and under workers' compensation and, um, and auto injuries or on, you know, on the job injuries, workers' comp, auto injuries you know, uh, as well, um, certain types of in insurance uh, coverage for some conditions uh, really is, would be a matter of um, number one, establishing causality. And that can be, um, that can be challenging um, because, um, you know, that can be challenging because uh, you, uh, you really need to uh, make a specific diagnosis and take a careful history and, and do a thorough physical examination um, because often in workers' compensation uh, and with auto injuries and, and other you know, sort of um, medical slash legal uh, cases, uh, there can be a tendency by, not all, but by some insurance carriers to be looking for um, an excuse to say that this is not part of the injury. Uh, and you know, usually from a, with a careful history and physical examination, uh, you can tease out whether the tailbone is indeed involved and from the history whether they had previous problems there uh, because you want to be as accurate and thorough, of course, as possible. Um, but it is another area where the appropriate imaging studies uh, come into play because often in uh, legal or medical legal cases, what you need is objective evidence that there's some pathology, you know, that there's some problem there. Um, and you don't always need that, you don't always have that, but when you have that, it certainly makes it much, much easier for the patient uh, to uh, talk to their insurance company uh, you know, or an administrative law judge and to say, okay, I had you know, no tailbone problems before, I had this accident at work or in my car or whatever, um, and now you know, um, I have this abnormality that there's a fracture or there's a dislocation or when I sit, uh, on that area that, um, that again, you know, the amount of, um, you know, that amount of, of flexion that, we, that you would look at that basically goes into that, you know, that dislocation, um, you know, when the, when the x-ray is done in that seated position. Um, so all of that is super helpful for um, objective information. All right, uh, there's a question here. I'm gonna read that, either one. It's, um, pelvic floor function. So it's about following a coccygectomy. Yeah, right. What changes are there in pelvic floor function? Uh, what changes at the sacroiliac joint and lumbar, uh, lumbar, lumbar? Sorry, uh, arthrokinematics. Um, do you want to talk about the anatomy in terms of attachments to the tailbone and and yep. how that ties into what happens when the tailbone itself is removed? Sure. So um, there are a few muscles that attach uh, to the coccyx. So um, You've got, and, and they form the anal diaphragm um, and, and, the, and the pelvic floor. So you've got um, ischial coccygeus coming from here to here. It fans out like that, a triangle shape. And then you've got levator ani, which forms up most of your pelvic floor. And they come to the middle and form an anal coccygeal raft. And that attaches to the tip of the coccyx that's on the front. And then on the back of the coccyx, you've got gluteus maximus uh, that, that attaches laterally to the coccyx as well. And all these structures um, form the, the posterior wall of the anal diaphragm. And uh, if you remove the coccyx, then you would sort of remove those uh, attachments as well. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, so it's an important point because um, what, would you, what would you say, Dr. Woon, to the patient who says, you know what, I have this tailbone pain. Um, I went and saw a surgeon. They spent three minutes with me and they said, oh, it's your tailbone. We're humans. We don't have tails. We don't need the tailbone. Let me just take it out. It's not doing anything whatsoever anyway. Mm -hmm. would you, what would you say? You know, and, and, and I've had many patients who've told me that, that their conversations have gone something along those lines. What, what would you say from a, a perspective as somebody with a PhD in coccyx anatomy? Um, so I, I'm not a surgeon and mm -hmm. so I, I don't know uh, in terms of the integrity of those mm -hmm. structures how much of it is 
kept. Mm -hmm. I have seen a couple of coccygectomies done, mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, I I would say that the those those integrity of those muscles would be compromised if you took out the coccyx. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what the surgeon does does afterwards, uh, in terms of uh, putting it back together. Mm -hmm. um, that is what I don't I don't understand how much of it is being put back together. Hi, highly variable, yeah. highly variable. Yeah. So um, so I would sort of right. And I think yeah. I think you touch on um, you know I'm sort of in a similar point where I'd say we know that anatomically there are structures that it, you know there are pelvic floor structures that attach to the coccyx. Um, I'm not sure if this uh, you know uh, we may have some pelvic floor physical therapists uh, you know joining us for the uh, for the Facebook live session. Uh, I've invited uh, a number of them to, to join in. Um, and this is an area too, when Dr. Woon is talking about the, uh, the pelvic floor structures, a, uh, a, a skilled and, and good pelvic floor physical therapist absolutely can be worth their weight in gold uh, at helping patients uh, with a lot of those uh, pelvic floor problems or dysfunctions uh, that can cause everything from you know, bowel and bladder and sexual problems and uh, and uh, myofascial pain in the uh, area of the um, piriformis and sacroiliac joint and throughout the pelvic floor and, and, and all of that. Um, so, so, uh, so with that said, when the tailbone is removed, there is, um, there is, some, there is some decrease in, you know, the things are not the same as they were, you know, prior to the surgery. There's, you know, you've lost some, uh, some attachment sites there. Um, is that catastrophic? In most people, no. The, the vast majority of the time when somebody has the tailbone removed, um, they do not have a hernia or a movement of, you know, of their rectum out through that area or, of, um, you know, or an incompetence of the, of the pelvic floor where there's pelvic floor prolapse. Um, the pelvic floor sometimes is described as being sort of like a hammock, you know, so it's like this you know, really it's more like a trampoline because it goes in multiple directions, but in two, in two dimensions you'd consider it kind of like a hammock so that when somebody stands up, you know, their, you know, their pelvic organs don't just, you know, fall through and, and drop down to the, uh, you know, to the floor. Um, but if you lose that attachment site, you, you, you lose a little bit of the integrity there. Mm -hmm. um, but in most people it's not, you know, substantial or dramatic or, or problematic, frankly. Um, there are problems, you know, the more common problems after coccygectomy th tend to be things like infection and um, long recovery time and, uh, and for many people can have, um, you know, some degree of persistent pain. So again, although most people do well, um, there are certainly, um, you know, many unfortunately, you know, that, uh, that do not. Um, you know, so, so that's about uh, the pelvic floor muscle changes. Um, within that same question about after coccygectomy, uh, is a question about the sacred iliac joint and, and, um, and sort of uh, lumbosacral movements in general. Um, a lot of that, even without coccygectomy, even with tailbone pain in general, um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that start to happen uh, throughout the pelvis and the lumbar spine. When somebody is having pain when they sit, so if, uh, if this is the chair and somebody is sitting down, uh, and the tailbone is kind of um, is kind of you know making contact with the chair. People will tend to sit leaning forward so that the tailbone is not so close to the sitting surface, or they'll sit leaning towards one side. Um, and if I sit leaning to one side for a prolonged time, you know that, that I'm doing that for days and weeks and months, um, absolutely, people will start to have all kinds of uh, other pelvic floor uh, and uh, and lumbosacral problems. They'll start to have sacroiliac joint pain, piriformis muscle pain, ischial bursitis. You know, um, you know, here down at the the other sit bones, uh, there's sort of this tripod of you know the two ischial bones, you know, one on each side, and then the tailbone or coccyx in the midline here. Um, so absolutely, the um, you know, there's an important interplay um, between what's going on in the tailbone and what's going on you know throughout the rest of the pelvis. All right, other questions. There's a New Zealand question here, so maybe okay. let you uh, field this one. So it's Julie from Tauranga. Um, so the pain was from a fall, okay. But you're asking for coccyx pain help in New Zealand. Um, You've got to wait for Dr. Woon to finish <laughs> medical school. That's the, yeah. that's the, that, you know, that's the, that's the long-term plan. 
it's the long-term plan um, for me to finish. I'm in my final year and then um, a few more years of training and mm -hmm. then I would like to, to deal with coccyx pain properly in mm -hmm. Australasia. Uh, in terms of getting a dynamic x-ray, I don't, good luck. You know, I don't think anyone does yes. dynamic x-rays in New Zealand. Uh, I haven't asked around, so I, I can't know for sure. I know they, um, so in terms of getting a diagnosis, um, that would be difficult. Uh, but there are people that do um, steroid injections um, in the coccyx. Uh, radiologists in, in Auckland do them. Mm -hmm. So, but, but getting dynamic x-ray and, and an accurate diagnosis, that's, that's harder. Um, and so we don't, yeah. Yeah, so, and that's um, certainly one of the problems, and this is a problem worldwide in terms of getting, um, in terms of getting an accurate um, you know, in terms of getting an accurate uh, diagnosis is that there's not a lot of places that will, uh, that know how to do the, the sitting versus standing x-rays. Uh, the sitting versus standing x-rays uh, were first, uh, you know, invented by uh, Dr. Maine, Jean-Yves Maine, uh, in Paris, France, uh, and really is absolutely brilliant in its um, simplicity and its, and its practicality. Uh, the idea that patients will tell you, I have pain at my tailbone, when I sit, especially if I sit leaning part way back. Uh, and the standard x-rays are done while a patient is standing. And you'd say, well, yeah, but doctor, that's not when I have my pain. And they say, well, yeah, but this is the way we do them. That's the standard, right? Uh, as if medicine knows best and that's just the way it's done. Um, and the tailbone looks totally normal while the person is standing. Uh, but again, when they go into you know, that, that seated position, uh, that they'll have a, a dislocation. In fact, I think I have, uh, yeah. Well, you know, in my book I have a, an image here that kind of shows this where uh, you can see the, the one image here, you know, where this would be sort of the x-ray you know, uh, or coccyx appearance, um, you know, while the person is standing up. And then when they sit down, sometimes you'll see this, this uh, large uh, dislocation uh, that happens in that, uh, you know, in that area. Um, and again, you know, that can, um, you know, that can be a, you know, that can tell you the cause of their pain that's been, you know, previously unknown. So again, that idea of doing the x-rays um, while the person is in the uh, sitting position uh, can be very, very helpful uh, along those lines. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I, um, I think in New Zealand and lots of places, it is a matter of um, call, ask if they treat tailbone pain, if you, you know, um, you know, I have, uh, there is a chapter in my book, and uh, one of the last chapters is about, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, collaborating with physicians and finding a physician and kind of the idea, if you, um, if you call a pain management center and you ask the receptionist whether the doctor treats coccyx pain or treats coccidinia, and if the receptionist says, treats what? I've never heard of that. Yeah, you, unfortunately, you sort of, um, you, you may have your answer uh, automatically. All right, let's see if there's uh, other questions here. All right, also I have an you know, encouragement. All right, so I got encouragement to come to um, Southern California, which is gorgeous, I've been there, and to come to New Zealand, which also is gorgeous and uh, you know, have not been there. Um, all right, let's see. I'm gonna take the next one um, on the MRI. Do tight muscles or ligaments pulling on the coccyx? show up on MRI. Um, MRI will show you inflammation, so edema would, would, uh, would show up. So in terms of having tight muscles or ligaments from coccyx pain, I'm guessing, I, I, I don't think it would show up. Yeah, you, yeah. I would agree. You, yeah. you, wouldn't, um, you wouldn't expect to see it and say, oh, the MRI tells me that that muscle is tight. Mm -hmm or that that muscle is in spasm. Um, for larger muscle groups, uh, you know, a, an MRI can show you if a muscle or a tendon or a ligament, if it's a structure, if it's a sizable, you know, uh, if it's one of a significant size, it can show you if there's a tear within the, within the, the muscle or tendon or ligament, um, both because you would see the, you know, you would see the, the tear within the structure, just like if you, you know, just like if you saw a tear you know, in a piece of paper or something like that and I was holding it up or fraying within a, a rope or string. 
Um, and as you mentioned, uh, the MRI, uh, MRI is done uh, in a number of different ways. Number one, the, there are certain MRIs done in slices, and the slices need to be done correctly in order to look at the structures in the area. Uh, and number two, it's essentially what I call filter settings. The uh, MRI physicists would probably cringe at uh, at calling it you know, the filter settings, but basically there's you know there are different settings you know T1 and T2 and stir images, etc. Um, and some of those are, are mainly settings that are looking specifically mostly at the bone. Others of them are looking more at, uh, you know, looking for signs of inflammation. Uh, so as Dr. Woon mentioned, you would be looking to see, uh, you know, if an area had a tear and had, you know, local inflammation there, um, you know, that would go along with it being uh, ongoing inflammation and that may, uh, that may have us think that that would be somebody might, who might benefit from putting an anti-inflammatory corticosteroid injection focally uh, at that spot. Um, so, um, so I guess back to answering this, uh, this person's question here, which is, um, do tight mu do muscles and ligaments and tendons um, and bones and all of that to some extent shows up at the tailbone, but the structures are very small and, um, and the ligaments in particular are very small. So, you know, if you look here, you know, just for, you know, for reference, you know, the tailbone, you know, about half the size of your pinky. And yet, you know, something so small can cause lots and lots of pain and suffering. And then when you get down to looking at individual, um, you know, ligaments between one bone and the next, uh, these structures are really uh, very tiny. Uh, and uh, you, don't see as, you don't see as much detail as we would like uh, always uh, on, the, uh, on the MRI studies. Um, but back to the issue about tight muscles and ligaments, um, dovetailing back to what, what I was uh, saying earlier about pelvic floor physical therapists can be extremely helpful uh, for those kinds of, uh, of issues uh, where if you have a lot of um, tight spasmed uh, muscles uh, that just won't uh, relax, for example, or some muscle groups may be weak and others may be you know, sort of uh, you know, in, uh, in spasm or kind of a guarding uh, mode, uh, a good pelvic floor physical therapist often can be very, very helpful for those components. So. Okay. Other questions? Uh, questions? So we've kind of answered this one. Sure. Yeah, this one, here's one that's about uh, pudendal nerve pain differing from sacroiliac joint pain uh, from somebody who had a coccygectomy 14 years ago. Um, so yes, um, uh, so a lot of people will have persistent pain at the area of the coccyx after the tailbone is removed. There's a number of uh, different reasons for that um, in itself because people would think, well, if my, if my tailbone is painful and then I have the tailbone removed, I should have zero pain. Most people, unfortunately, after they have a coccygectomy, um, have some degree of symptoms in the area. Um, for, the, for the vast majority, the, the symptoms are dramatically less. Um, I do not do the surgeries. I'm not a surgeon, uh, nor is uh, Dr. Woon. Uh, but, um, you know, and most people with tailbone pain do not need surgical treatment. Most, fortunately, do respond to non-surgical care. Uh, but for those who do, most do well. Uh, but many have some persistent discomfort, uh, whether that's from scar tissue or nerve irritation or other things. Um, back to this question, though, about pudendal nerve and sacroiliac joint. Um, as we talked about earlier, sometimes it's a matter of the way people are sitting to take pressure off of the tailbone. Uh, and um, you know, certain, and usually a, a good history and physical examination can tease that out. Um, or again, on my website, tailbonedoctor.com forward slash blog, B-L-O-G, uh, there's a little search box there for um, online articles I've written on either sacroiliac joint pain or pudendal uh, nerve pain that, that can answer some of those uh, details for you. So here's someone who's saying that uh, on May 15th, they have uh, a doctor who's going to be taking out only the hypermobile piece of the coccyx, which is the last piece. Uh, what do you recommend, whole or partial coccygectomy? Mm, I think when it comes to surgery, doing less is better. Uh, if, if you've got an accurate diagnosis, which it sounds like you do, mm -hmm. uh, you've done your dynamic x-rays, you've found um, and it matches with the clinical history and the examination. The pain is uh, highly suspected to be in a specific joint. Mm -hmm. And you've tried all, all conservative treatment. 
Um, I'd say it's fine to just take out the, the bones that are causing the pain. Yeah. So yeah, the, um, the, and that decision, complete versus partial coccygectomy, partial where you take off the, typically the lower uh, portion of the tailbone and leave maybe the first bone or so of the coccyx in place uh, versus taking out the entire thing. Um, and as Dr. Woon uh, alluded to, the diagnosis becomes important because if, you're, if somebody had their problem uh, you know, up here at the, uh, you know, at the sacrococcygeal joint where the sacrum meets the coccyx, and that joint is still left in place, and, and that first bone is left in place, and they remove everything below that, well, the painful joint or the joint with the instability or the arthritis is still there. So really, the surgery in that case would not have addressed the problem. Um, on the other hand, if the problem was lower down, you may be able to, to get by with taking off less. Um, there was um, there's one study from years ago that had looked at um, you know, complete versus partial coccygectomy and, and seemed to imply that people who had a complete coccygectomy did better, but, in that, but it was a small, uh, a small number of patients and they did not specify, well, what joint was abnormal. Uh, and then number two is that there was a more recent study, and I think I, I, think I posted about this uh, again on, the, on my website, um, uh, and I think it was a Turkish study uh, that basically you know, found that partial versus complete tended to do about the same. And if that's the case, then you'd say, okay, well, leave as much you know, natural stuff in place you know, as you can to do the job. So um, in the end, of course, it's a, it's a, um, it's a decision for the individual um, you know, surgeon to make with, the, with their patient. Uh, and also having been at coccygectomy surgeries, uh, I can tell you sometimes it's a matter of the surgeon is thinking that they're going to do, you know, that this is the most likely thing that they're going to do. And when they actually, you know, open things up and, and see the status of what's there and have that direct visualization uh, and, and feel the, the bones and, and are doing the procedure, uh, they may determine that they were planning to do a partial, but now they're doing a complete or, or the reverse. All right, we'll take just a couple of more questions here. I'm talking about, about yoga. So yoga for stretching in the area. I guess the things I would say there, um, the, um, it depends. There are, there are certainly stretches you can do to help with muscular pain. But if you have a bone spur on the tip of your coccyx, I, you know, that's, that's, the cause, that's the primary cause of your pain, the yoga and the stretching program may help with that muscular sort of spasm or guarding that happens, but I would not expect it to, to help with the, the, the pain that's at the tip itself. Um, there, is a, there is a chapter in here on exercise and tailbone pain, and I do have a section in there on yoga, and just to summarize, uh, summarize that for you. The main thing to be careful with in yoga is probably things like boat pose. Um, boat pose, which is uh, kind of where you, you know, have some let, you know, you know, kind of have your, you know, two legs up, you know, basically to strengthen your core. Um, you're sort of in this V position. Uh, I'll come closer, you can hear me. So um, boat pose is almost like if you were to design a yoga pose to cause as much tailbone pain as possible, that would be boat pose. Um, so there's a few things like that that you can avoid and do the other 99% of yoga that, you know, that can be helpful for your flexibility and well-being and, uh, and general musculoskeletal health, um, but without flaring up the tailbone. All right, let's see. Someone with coccyx pain after a fall. They've had a lot of health problems. Um, okay. Someone who's a couple years out. Oh, this is a longer one. Do you want to read it on there? Um, I actually can't see it. On oh, okay. Top. All right. So I'll just summarize this one. Two years out from full removal surgery for coccygectomy. Uh, Ten years of chronic pain. Many injections. Uh, doctor has mentioned a possible spinal cord stimulator. Uh, what are your thoughts? So a spinal cord stimulator, just to tell you a little about um, the idea of a spinal cord stimulator. The idea is that, in general... When, um, when we have a stimulus, when we have something that, we're, that our body is feeling or sensing you know, repetitively all the time, we tend to ignore it. Uh, the example I always use is that until I bring it up right now, probably none of us are conscious of you know, the feeling of you know, our shirt touching our shoulder. 
Um, and why? Because it's been on there, you know, all day since we, you know, since we put the shirt on this morning, and your body starts to ignore that, right? So I, so we start to ignore, you know, the sound of the, you know, refrigerator humming in the background, or the air ventilation, or or the weight of my glasses on the bridge of my nose. I, it, it's not even there for me. I just ignore it. So what a spinal cord stimulator, do, you know, tries to do is to localize where in the at the spinal cord. Uh, are the nerves, uh, you know, are the nerve fibers that are coming from a given body region. And as the stimulator you know, term implies, it's basically going to give an electrical stimulation there. And, and basically by giving that, you know, it's almost like a um, kind of like a rapid uh, tingling sensation. Uh, and the idea is that the body will start to ignore that area just like, you know, you ignore the, you know, the feeling of your clothes on your, on your shoulder. Um, so, uh, spinal cord stimulators are more commonly used for lumbar pain, lumbar radiculopathy, despite surgery, those kinds of things, quote unquote failed back syndrome, um, less commonly used for the coccyx, um, you know, partly because the coccyx is just less, um, is far less common than lumbar problems, um, but also the area of the spine, because the tailbone is so small, the area that needs to be targeted uh, for coccygectomy is relatively uh, small as well, and um, and it can vary uh, somewhat more from patient to patient. So, um, so I do occasionally send patients for consultation for spinal cord stimulators, um, and I think it's it's not a crazy option uh, if you have a physician that is uh, familiar with uh, doing spinal cord stimulation specifically for the coccyx, um, because most doctors who are doing spinal cord stimulation probably have not done it uh, very frequently for tailbone problems. Okay, you wanna take the next? Um, the next question, are levator ani muscles attached to the ILA or ALA? So, ALA? yeah, so basically, um, basically talking about sort of the, uh, you know, you know, the in basically, are you attaching? And I think when they're saying reattached, you know, to that, uh, you know, to that lower part of the sacrum, um, are they reattaching them? So, so I think this goes back to the surgical question of at coccygectomy, what does the surgeon actually do after he or she removes the tailbone? And again, highly variable. Um, you know, I guess. We sort of touched on earlier, but I, yeah. But I can, yeah. In the coccygectomies that you've seen, have you seen a surgeon ever tr ever say, "Okay, I have the coccyx out. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to, you know, throw throw sutures, you know, specifically through. In this case, they're asking about levator or ani, mm -hmm. and actually try to attach that to the sacrum. Probably not, right? Because to attach it to the sacrum, you know, you can't just you can't throw a suture into the sacrum, it's, you know, it's a, it's a large, solid, strong bone. You need a bone anchor. You would yeah. need a bone anchor, right? Just like if somebody's having a rotator cuff surgery and, you know, or something, and you can, sometimes you'll see uh, on x-ray, you know, or in the surgery, there'll be these anchors that are put in place. So basically, it's almost like a, you know, like a small screw, like you would screw, you know, into the wall to, to hang, like, you know, for a hook and eye, you know, uh, you know set up or something. Um, so it's really not, it's really not really, uh, done quite in that way. It's more that they tighten things up as, as best they can at the surgical site, um, and that they may try to leave in the periosteum, which is a very, very thin uh, you know, layer uh, around the, um, you know, of, uh, the shell, essentially, that the, that the bones are in. Um, and again, I have an online article on that, too, if you're interested in sort of more details where I go through, you know, specifically, what's the measurement, you know, you know that periosteum is, you know, it's sort of uh, it's sort of just wispy paper thin, yeah. and how much you know the surgeon will say I'm I'm leaving that in place as best I can. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know a few other thoughts on that. No. no. All right. Um, in my patients, uh, I have not seen prolapse after coccygectomy, but have seen wound healing issues and some rectal control issues. Um, so this is someone in their patient, so I'm assuming this is a, uh, a pelvic floor uh, clinician uh, of one sort or another, perhaps uh, a physician or a pelvic floor physical therapist uh, or other uh, clinician in this area. So yeah, so, um, so again, prolapse is not the most common thing, absolutely. Uh, your experience is similar to what uh, I've seen as well. Far more common to see wound healing problems 
uh, and infection and in some cases needing repeat surgery to uh, clean out the infected tissue is far more common than prolapse. Um, in terms of prolapse, specifically of the rectum, uh, I'll have Dr. Woon tell you, you know, because he's just done a, uh, uh, an extensive uh, literature search going back, uh, how far is the... Uh, um. A hundred years. Yeah, we've 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 just been uh, this week collecting uh, about a hundred years worth of uh, of articles specifically about uh, herniation uh, and at the uh, you know rectal herniation especially uh, at the uh, coccygectomy site. Um, what was the most common uh, line that they said in each study? Uh, All right, um, this has never been reported before. Right, so it's first time. Right, so uh, so it's interesting because we go back to the studies from you know. Uh, from you know 10 or 15 years ago and they say oh rectal prolapse after coccygectomy a case report this has never been reported before and then you look back at you know another one from what 1960s you know and then yeah. another one from the 1930s yeah. and all of them are saying hey rectal prolapse after coccygectomy this has never been reported before uh, you know so um, when really it's in the literature it's just a matter of, uh, of, of finding that in there uh, but certainly I agree with the uh, commenter here that it's uh, far more common to have wound problems. All right, um, we're going to go quickly through the last uh, few here to sort, of, uh, to sort of wrap up just to, to uh, try to finish within the hour. Um, but then this will be, uh, this will be available, uh, this video will be available on uh, Facebook on the uh, page for the Tailbone Pain Center. So facebook.com slash uh, Tailbone Pain Center uh, with no spaces. Uh, and also I'll post it on, um, on my website, which is tailbonedoctor.com, and also my YouTube channel, uh, which that one is Tailbone Pain Doctor. Uh, but anyway, the, let's see, the question here is about uh, pain, le lower, left lower abdomen, feels like labor pain, had ultrasound, everything looks fine. Um, you know, could that be abdominal pain? Could it be related to the coccyx? It may or may not be related to the coccyx. Um, and I would say, yeah, a, a good history and physical exam will usually tease that out. Uh, from the comments that this person has made so far, um, if you're not having pain specifically at the tailbone, uh, and it's not tender at the tailbone, when you yourself push there, or your, your clinician, your um, you know, physical therapist or physician uh, presses on that area, then, uh, then it may not be from the tailbone at all. Uh, but again, for what you're describing, uh, often a good uh, pelvic floor physical therapist could be uh, very helpful at, at helping to tease some of that out for you. Um, here's someone saying that, uh, oh, at 71, she, yeah, someone who can't wait, can't, uh, understandable, right, they can't wait for, uh, for Dr. Woon to, uh, uh, to go from being a doctor with a PhD to being a, 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 a medical doctor. Um, so, um, so yeah, if there's anyone, uh, if there's anybody on the post who uh, who is in New Zealand who has found uh, uh, clinicians there that are uh, particularly helpful, um, certainly you can uh, you can uh, you know comment and re respond to uh, you know to uh, your fellow um, Kiwi. Is that the right term? Your, your fellow your fellow Kiwi there. Um, what outcomes do you see with coccygectomy when nerve ablations haven't worked consistently? Um, so again, it, it still goes to the same where most people, um, the vast majority of people do not need coccygectomy, but for those who do, uh, the, um, most people get a lot of relief from coccygectomy. Um, just that the recovery is long and that the relief often is incomplete. Um, so you know, in, you know, I've been treating patients with coccyx pain for roughly 23 years now, a few thousand patients. Uh, and my practice focuses on helping people avoid surgery and, and providing non-surgical care. But absolutely, there's patients who I'm referring for surgery, the people who, uh, you know, that small percentage of people, you know, um, you know, maybe 2% or so, where none of the injections provide adequate, uh, you know, relief or they, or they don't provide enough sustained benefit. And in those cases, the surgery um, may indeed be, uh, be, help, be uh, uh, helpful. Um, so worth getting the consultation in those cases. All right. Thank you for your answer. You're very welcome. How can you tell if, if coccyx is uh, curled up due to tight muscles or previously broken? To some extent, back to the imaging studies. Um, um, yeah, um, an X-ray should be able to look for a fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, a CT would be better. 
Mm. Um, in terms of tight muscles curling up the tailbone, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think the question there is if your if your pelvic floor is really tight. Yeah. So if, if my hand here represents some of the muscles of the pelvic floor, and if they're really tight and pulling the tailbone forward, you know, so could that be the, you know, could the tight muscles be the reason? And there is a little bit of a um, chicken and an egg phenomenon, right? Which came first? Was it, that, was it that you had a problem at the tailbone that caused a lot of pain? And just like if I had pain in my, in my arm, in my elbow here, I would start to hold it like this and I'd start to get all of this muscle tightness and spasm up in the muscles in my shoulder that wasn't even the primary involved area originally. So you can have problems that where, where you have something causing pain at the coccyx and the muscles start to go into spasm or guarding. Um, so now you, you're, you're saying, well, which one is the primary problem? Similarly, you could have times where you have a lot of muscle spasm, and because those muscles are attaching here, that they're pulling the coccyx uh, you know, somewhat forward. Um, so it's largely it's a matter of history, physical examination, uh, and focusing on the area that you think the pain is the worst. All right, we're going to skim through some of these. And um, one of the things I'll try to do for any questions that we did not answer. Um, I'll try to get on um, uh, online on Facebook maybe this weekend, um, you know, and and sort of you know answer them in uh, in typed out form there as well. Um, so the question here: After tailbones removed, what would cause severe sweating in the area and a burning type of burning and scalding type of pain? Sweating is quite, is interesting because it makes me think of like. Is that sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, you know, altered in that area? Um, so, I don't know your thoughts on that. Um, well, the sympathetic um, nervous system is it's pretty it's it's just in front of the coccyx, and mm -hmm. if you remove your tailbone, chances are you will remove the ganglion impar and other sympathetic fibers. Um, so that could be a reason for the sweating. In terms of a burning pain, I, I don't yeah, the pain, right? The pain sometimes in in any surgical area, um, when the surgeon goes in, um, he or she does their best job to take out what they think they need to, uh, take out the cause of the pain if it's surgery that's being done to remove a painful structure, um, but to cause as little trauma to the uh, to the nearby tissues as possible. Um, but you're cutting through muscles and tendons and ligaments and nerves to some extent in that area, uh, although the tailbone fortunately is relatively close to the surface. Fortunate when it comes to, you know, the surgery doesn't have to be particularly deep. Unfortunate when it comes to when you s sit down for a long time or slip on the ice, you know, the, and, and land onto the buttocks, the tailbone doesn't have much padding because there's no muscle tissue immediately behind it. Um, but again, the 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 comment you make about the, this person makes about um, you know sweating in that area you know kind of uh, has me thinking about that you know sympathetic nervous system um, you know which is part of what's kind of our fight or flight response uh, there is uh, there's a chapter in here which is chapter 12 is all about uh, sympathetic nervous system pain in the coccyx and it and it goes into uh, what uh, Dr. Woon was just talking about which is uh, you know some of the uh, sympathetic nerve uh, fibers that are in that area they may or may not be re uh, removed at the time of the surgery. It really depends on the details of the surgery and how far forward the surgeon came uh, at that time. Okay, let's see. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. A friend of mine is complaining of sciatica. Is there an explanation for that? Yeah, so for sciatica is usually a term people use to, when they're talking about um, you know, back pain that travels down the leg. Um, usually be, yeah, it can be because of irritation of the nerve roots up in the lumbar spine or the sciatic nerve uh, out at the buttocks uh, at the uh, piriformis area in particular. Um, so uh, usually a good history and physical examination um, can help to tease that out. You two guys should head over to the United Kingdom. Oh, let's see. All right, this is a long one, so it's a little tougher for me to read on my uh, on my phone here because I can only see a couple of lines at once. Educate medics um, about managing pain so they stop wasting the, you know, basically, the, you know, that they stop wasting patients' time. Um, yeah, it sounds like somebody who's had a lot of different treatments uh, and basically is saying that, um, 
yeah, a lot of education is needed within the United Kingdom. Yeah, a lot of education is needed right here in the States and in, you know, you know, New Zealand, New Zealand uh, you know, uh, Australia, Asia. Um, I do have, for, if you're, for those of you who are listening that are specifically in the United Kingdom, um, I do have a couple of online articles that I've written specifically about, uh, about navigating your way through the NHS, the National Health Service. In fact, um, on my website, tailbonedoctor.com forward slash blog, B-L-O-G, again, that little search box in the upper right-hand corner of the page, if you just put in NHS for National Health Service, it'll bring up a, a number of online articles I've written about um, specifically, and I have uh, copied and pasted sections of the NHS criteria for imaging studies because a lot of times your local general practitioner may tell you that oh you know we don't do uh, x-rays you know within the NHS we don't do x-rays for tailbone pain and um, that's not completely true it's you know what it tells you in the criteria is uh, from the NHS themselves is um, if the pain is persistent and problematic that absolutely they do x-rays uh, and uh, even there's a section in there about seated x-rays so again if you search on my website for NHS uh, it'll pull up a few articles that can be helpful because then you can literally you know print that section of the NHS guidelines right off my website and uh, and that may help you all right someone here who had a com uh, who had a complete removal and has uh, and has no pain excellent news so a successful surgical outcome uh, someone's saying, can you review my question? It looks like it was skipped over and a frowny face. Um, I'm really limited here because if you saw this on my iPhone, I have about, you know, this much of a sliver to see, uh, to see what question I may have uh, missed along the way and sometimes when a bunch come in. So what I, I'll, I will promise you this though, I will go through, uh, I will go through uh, the questions uh, and for anything that we didn't answer uh, verbally, uh, I'll make sure to uh, I'll make sure to uh, type up a, a response there for you. Um, all right. So it looks like that's uh, we're we're near the we're a little over the uh, the hour that we had planned to go uh, through with this. Um, final words from uh, from Dr. Woon, who'll be uh, leaving leaving the United States soon, um, but uh, but certainly has been uh, terrific, um, not just in this session, but speaking with you about all things. Uh, tailbone pain related. Um, any other thoughts or comments you want to add? Um, hmm. No, I, I feel like I've, I've learned a lot just um, uh, in, my, in my few weeks here and um, I think there's a lot of work to be done with mm -hmm. uh, coccyx pain and you know New Jersey's lucky to have Dr. Foy and uh, hopefully that um, other physicians will um, you know take the research seriously and and take the patient seriously because mm -hmm. it's a very debil debilitating um, uh, it's really debilitating to have pain in your coccyx so yes. yeah excellent okay um, well I want to thank Dr. Woon for um, for being here he gave a terrific uh, lecture last night for the uh, New Jersey Society of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation um, yeah I'm, I'm working on getting the video for that and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to put that uh, up online uh, as well, and I appreciate uh, your time here and the work that you're doing. And I'm I'm really excited just seeing where you are early in your career and already having uh, momentum from your PhD work and from uh, some of the um, you know uh, teaching that you did at the International Coccyx Pain Symposium. Uh, you know when we were there uh, this past June of 2018 uh, in the Netherlands, and um, and I'm looking forward to sort of uh, you know. The, uh, the work that you'll do uh, moving forward. Uh, for folks who want to reach um, me, the easiest way is probably on my, through my website, which is www.tailbonedoctor.com, uh, or I made some references to the book. If you're interested in, in, uh, in getting a copy of the book, uh, the easiest way for that is through Amazon. Um, you know, if you just go to Amazon and put in Tailbone Pain and, and uh, my last name, which is Foy, as, as F as in Frank, O-Y-E, um, you know, it should pull up the book in whatever country you're in. You can get the electronic copy, you can get the, um, the paperback or whatever you like. Um, also, while we're talking, you know, tip of the hat also to uh, Dr. Main uh, in Paris, France, who certainly uh, did a lot of groundbreaking work um, on uh, tailbone pain and the imaging studies and someone who, uh, who both Dr. Woon and I have, uh, have um, you know, 
been been reading and quoting and uh, and learning from for years. So uh, so uh, tip of the hat certainly to him as well. All right. With that said, um, thanks everybody. Uh, great having you here. And um, and even after the video is over, if you post comments down below, uh, I can see those and uh, and uh, respond to some of those as well. All right. Bye bye now. Good night.